Well, good morning. My name is Kyle, and um, something that some of you know about me and some of you don't is that I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, originally. And I was at a wedding this weekend talking to people from all over the country and all over the world, and some of them didn't know about Memphis, and they were asking me about it. Like, what's Memphis like? And, you know, I started thinking about it. Like, how would I describe it? And if you want to know anything about Memphis, first you've got to know about music. Right? So I talked about Sun Studios and Stack Records and talked about the Reverend Al Green, the Rev. <laughs> Uh, but you also need to know something about our tragic and spotted and, and checkered history. Um, uh, so you have to talk about the, the Lorraine Motel. You have to talk about uh, the shooting assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. You need to know something about that, right? These are the important things that you need to know if you're going to go to Memphis. You also need to know about barbecue. You also need to know about the blues. You also need to know about grit, grind, grizz, and the grizzlies. You need to know about all kinds of things. But these are the most important things if you want to understand what the city's like. Today we're starting a new series, and that new series is on our core values and priorities as a church. And we're going to be looking at that through this semester. And these core values and priorities are really what you need to understand if you want to understand who we are as a church and what makes us tick and what animates us. Right? Uh, this, is, this is our barbecue, if you will. This is our, um, the things that we value. And, and we're starting this morning with the value which tops them all, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The text that we're looking at this morning uh, has literally changed the world. And I say that in a number of levels. That's not an overstatement. It's sociologically and communally and uh, economically, it's totally changed the world because it was this passage that Martin Luther meditated upon that a lot of people say would one of the most inciting features of the Reformation, which has totally transformed Europe and the world uh, in, in good and bad ways, I would say. Uh, and uh, this text, though, has also transformed the world spiritually. It was in reading this text that Martin Luther was completely overcome by the grace of God and transformed. And it was in his proclamation of this text and his developing this text to his students and his lectures that completely transformed his students and and others. And so there's power in these words. That's what we believe. I want to pray because I, I hope that I don't just explain the power, that, but that we experience it. So let me pray. God, I do ask that as we open up your word, you would reveal yourself and all your saving power. Some of us here have never experienced you and we're wondering if you even exist. We have doubts and questions about Christianity. We have doubts and questions about ourselves and the world. We're all at sea. Lord, would you come and reveal yourself to us? Others of us, Lord, are excited. We believe in you, but we, we need you just as much every day and every hour. And so would you reveal yourself to us graciously again? Would you do so through this chosen means? these moments that we can spend overhearing this, this good news about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in his name that I do pray. Amen. Well, I wonder how many of you are familiar with the name Duke Silver. Maybe you don't know the name Duke Silver. Maybe you name, know the name Ron Swanson. Ron Swanson is the fictional character on Parks and Recreation. And by the way, this is the high point of my cultural uh, like illustrations this morning, so just eat it up. So Ron Swanson is a fictional character on Parks and Recreation, played by Nick Offerman. Uh, he's hilarious. Uh, he is the director of the Parks and Recreation Department at Pawnee, Indiana. He's also a staunch libertarian who believes that all government should be privatized and that the Department of Parks and Recreation shouldn't even exist. Right? Uh, but Ron Swanson has a secret. He's got this gift, like this amazing gift. He's actually a very proficient saxophone player. 
but he's a little bit embarrassed about it. He doesn't want anyone to know. And so what he does is under, under the name Duke Silver, he plays in the neighboring town of Eagleton at Cozy's Bar every other Thursday. He's got quite a following there at Cozy's Bar, but it's an intimate crowd of mainly middle-aged women who come and see Duke Silver, his saxophone, and his mustache. You know, I think that describes the church. We have a saxophone and a mustache. No, not really. It describes the church insofar as this. As I was thinking about the church, I was thinking about Duke Silver, because that's what I do. I just lay around and think about those things together. I was thinking, you know, we have this gift that if we're honest, we can be a little bit embarrassed about. And so oftentimes we can go into our little cozy churches and keep the gift to ourselves. Just like Ron Swanson. And there are reasons for this. I get it. I mean, the reality is, is that in our society, less and less people are professing Christianity. That's just a fact. And with less and less people professing Christianity, that means that the plausibility structures for Christianity, the ideas of Christianity, don't sound as plausible to people as they once did. Uh, moreover, um, Christianity just doesn't have the street cred that it once did, you know? You used to get, like, pastor's discounts when you walked into places. I keep asking for that here, and the coffee shop folks look at me like, what are you talking about, right? Um, but I found out that if you have a mustache, you do get a discount at the coffee shops, by the way. But the, the reality is, 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 that, is that Christianity doesn't have the automatic respect that it once did. In fact, for some, it's, in some communities, it's considered silly, a crutch, maybe anti-intellectual. And because more and more people are uncovering lots of the really bad things in the church, and they're coming to light, and the sin in the church, it can also be understood as maybe dangerous and hostile. And I mean, so when we, when we go out into the world, I mean, I don't want to be thought about as silly or anti-intellectual. And it's kind of scary that every time I talk to someone, they're coming from a different place. And because they're coming from a different place, I have to kind of like, like give an apologetic for my view of the world, which sounds crazy to them, and I don't want to do that, so I'd rather just kind of be quiet, right? Many of us don't just, but we don't feel competent to engage the world around us, which is changing so quickly, and it's kind of scary. I get that. The Apostle Paul is writing to a community <laughs> people who are in Rome. When he writes to the people who are in Rome, he is writing to a city and a culture that is very much like the one that we live in. A one where Christianity is going to be looked upon with suspicion, where it's going to sound crazy that they worship this one God and three persons. It's going to sound absolutely crazy that their leader was crucified by an instrument of torture from them. I mean, this, and that you're saying that that is, that is the way that God is going to reveal his power and save the world. I mean, that is not so. And yet, how does Paul respond to the Romans? I want you to look in verse 15. He says, I am eager. I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. I am eager. I, Paul can't wait to get to Rome and talk to these people who completely disagree with him, who will think he's crazy. How is that the case? And, and Paul knows that not everyone is like him. Did you notice that? He goes on, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now, when do you say I'm not ashamed of something? Well, I'm not ashamed to call you friend. I, I'm not ashamed that I watch Parks and Rec. I'm not ashamed that, you know, I like big hair bands from the 80s. I'm not ashamed. When do you say I'm not ashamed? You say I'm not ashamed when people think, oh, there could be reason to feel shame over that. Right? 
That's why you say I'm not ashamed. So why does Paul say I'm not ashamed? Because he knows that the Roman Christians have a tendency like us to feel a little bit ashamed about the central message of Christianity, about the central beliefs that they hold. So here's the question. Why is Paul so eager to proclaim this central message of Christianity in Rome? And if we can answer that question, might we have the same eagerness to talk about our faith today? The same confidence in the message of Christianity today? Well, I want to give you three reasons because I'm a Presbyterian minister and that's how I was trained to preach, even though I often don't preach like that. Uh, the three reasons are this. I think that Paul is eager to preach the good news, the message about Christianity, the central message in Rome, because of what that message is, because of what that message does, and because of who that message is for. So first, Paul is eager to preach this central message of Christianity because of what that message is. Paul mentions what he is going to do, what he's coming to do, in verse 15 and verse 16. He says that he is going to proclaim the gospel to them. That he's not ashamed of the gospel. This word gospel is something, a word that he uses four times just in this opening of Romans. And the word gospel in and of itself means, it's a word from secular society, it means good news. It means to announce good news. It's what the Roman Empire did when they wanted to proclaim that Caesar did something great. They had good news. And so Paul says, I am here, I am eager to go to Rome because I have good news. You know, there's a lot of bad news in the world. Do you ever get tired of the headlines? I mean, you know, I open up my computer every day, in the morning usually, I read the headlines. I watch the report, I read different news feeds, and it's... It's just about all bad, or at least kind of ominous. In this world, there's a lot of bad news. And every once in a while, you get to hear some good news. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever had good news? And not just like a little bit of good news, but like life-changing news. Have you ever had that happen? I was, um, I was counseling someone who was considering getting married. And he was like, I don't know how I'm going to get married because uh, this girl that I'm dating is still in school and she's got this grad program that she's got to enter into next. I've got all this student loan debt that I need to pay off. I've just gotten out. I don't have a job that's making a lot of money. I'm not sure how we're going to do this. I certainly can't, you know, like pay for a place with us afterwards. But I also don't know that I can, uh, I also don't know that I can, be able to um, afford an apartment and things like that, right? And, and put her through school. And, uh, and, I'm, and we were in the middle, of, we're working through this and talking through this, and then he comes to me one day and he says, Kyle, I got a ring. I'm like, what? It's like, I got good news. He goes, my parents called me and they said, hey, we want you to know that the inheritance money came through from your grandparents. And it's X amount of dollars. And we're going to pay off your student loans. And you have this much extra. And it was enough to get started in his marriage. Yeah, that's good news. That's life-changing news. That will alter the direction of your life kind of news. Have you ever in your life gotten to tell someone news like that? Like good news. You know, one of the reasons I think that we aren't eager to talk about the central message of Christianity is because I think somewhere along the way we have gotten confused and thought that the central message of Christianity is not good news, but it's necessary guidelines or a code of ethics. Or, or, or a technique to master. And, and I mean, yes, those things can all change your life, but it's not news. It's something that you have to give yourself over to and master and do this. And, and maybe if you're not a Christian in here, one of the reasons that you've rejected Christianity or haven't found it so appealing is because what you hear 
from Christians. And what you see in Christians is you see just another mode of self-improvement. And you think, well, I already have the self-reform thing. And I'm working on it, and this seems to work for me. So I'm glad you have your way. I have my way. We're all kind of on this path, and we're just trying to make it work. But listen, Christianity does not provide a resource. It provides a rescue. Christianity, it is not about a path. It is about a parachute. The gospel comes, and it's not about... It's not about a lifestyle, but about another's life, the life of Jesus Christ, the perfect life of Jesus Christ, who lived for you and died for you and rose for you. And it's that life on your behalf. You see, and that's grace. This is the central news of Christianity, grace. Grace means gift. And it's a gift that's given without regard to worth. Grace is God's kiss to the hostile. Grace is God's rescue for runaways. Grace is, grace is, grace is God's betrothal to the betrayer. Grace is the opposite of karma. Grace is God's unconditioned love. And it's good news. It's good news for me and for you. Christianity is good news. Good news. Christ died once, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. Good news. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Good news. What the law and every other program of self-improvement and guilt management could not accomplish, God accomplished by sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as a sin offering, He condemned sin in the flesh so that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Good news. Good news. Christ died for sinners. The central message of Christianity is good news. And when you got good news... Man, that's something you want to tell people. That's something you want to tell people about. And by the way, because it's news and not a self-improvement program or anything like that, the fundamental response to this news is faith, trust. Did you see that? He says, the righteous shall live by faith, from faith to faith. It's from faith to first to last because, because when you get... Like my friend, when he got the news that he got the inheritance, sure, it totally changed his life. And he did things as a result of it. But the first and foremost response to that news was believing it. That the money's in the account. That the debts have been paid. That he can move forward in his life trusting that what his parents told him was true. And believing that word. The first reason I think Paul is eager to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome is because the central message of Christianity is good news. The second reason I think uh, that he is eager to preach the gospel, the central message of Christianity in Rome, is because of what that central message does. Look at verse 16. Paul writes, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And here's the reason, for it is the power of God for salvation. It is the power of God for salvation. And we all need to be saved. We all need to be saved from something. Saved from disaster, saved from self-destruction, saved from past abuse, saved from addiction, saved from oppression, saved from judgment. We all need to be saved. And our lives all point to that. Listen to me. If, if you practice mindfulness, you're only showing that you need to be saved. And I think that's a fine thing to practice mindfulness. If, if you do breathing exercises, you show that you need to be saved. If you take a pill to help you, you show that you need to be saved. Like all of these things are just evidence that we're all caught in something. And, and, this, and the something is bigger than any of these things can provide a remedy for. Yeah, they stay it and they help for a little while. But we need a solution that is way bigger than this. We need salvation. I mean, if you if you have if you have like relationships with your family that are strained, 
you show that you need to be saved. If you have health problems, you show that you need to be saved. If you have unmet desires, you show that you need to be saved. Like, we all need to be saved. And this is good news because, because it is a power that comes to save us. Recently, we had a banana tree move because it got like huge and all gnarly. And so we pulled the banana tree out and we went away to Hawaii and we came back. I kid you not, there's a banana tree almost the same size sitting in the same spot. No. There are several banana trees. They are popping up all over our yard. I start talking to like that person who knows landscaping. They're like, well, it's actually kind of like grass, and so it just starts growing up everywhere, the roots do. And I'm like, oh, great. So I mean, soon, if you want bananas, don't go to the grocery store. Just come to my house, because we'll have plenty, right? And it's like, you can pull those things out all you want, but they're going to grow up everywhere, because unless you get down to the root, I mean, they've infiltrated everything. That's how sin is. That's what our problem is. And we need something that can actually deal with the problem. Paul is eager to preach the good news to those who are in Rome because he thinks the good news can deal with the problem. Why? Why does he think that this gospel can deal with the problem? Well, first, because it comes from a different source. Notice what he says. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is what? The power of God. The God who brought all things into existence by the power of his word. The God who sustains all things by the power of that same word. The God who plans the end from the beginning. The God who opens the womb of the barren and shuts the mouths of lions and confuses armies and topples cities. The power of God who heals the sick, gives sight to the blind, and raises the dead. That's the power that is unleashed and and at work in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was 1984, and Daniel Rousseau moved to California. He was a very lonely and isolated kid, and he was bullied in his high school by the Cobra Kai. Karate kid, you know what I'm talking about. I told you Parks and Rec was the high point. He's bullied by the Cobra Kai, and he is trying to figure out, how do I deal with this? And so what he does is at a Halloween party, he decides that he's going to retaliate by playing a prank on Johnny. Johnny is the leader of the Cobra Kai. And so Johnny is in the bathroom, and he takes this, uh, he takes this hose, and he you know, douses Johnny with water. Next thing you know, the Cobra Kai are chasing Daniel, and he ends up cornered against a fence. And then five Cobra Kai to one Daniel Russo, they start having their way with him until Mr. Miyagi shows up. Mr. Miyagi jumps down from outside this environment. Daniel's son is getting beat up. Mr. Miyagi jumps in and he opens up a can on the Cobra Kai. He picks, <laughs> he picks Daniel up. Some of you really like that. He picks <laughs> Daniel up and he nurses him back to health. Like, there was nothing, no resources in Daniel that were going to get him out of that situation. He needed a power from outside. He needed someone to invade that space. He was trapped against the wall. He was five to one, and there was no way. He needed Mr. Miyagi. We need Mr. Miyagi. We have a power greater than Mr. Miyagi. We have a power that comes from outside, that invades our world, that rescues us, and releases us because it opens up a can on all the forces of evil outside of us and inside of us that are enslaving the people of God. And God picks us up and he says, my son, my daughter, and he nurses us back to health. 
See, the gospel is God's rescuing power, which breaks into this world. And that's why Paul is confident that it can do the job. And he's also confident because it reveals God's righteousness. Look how Paul goes on. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the righteousness of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then he goes on, verse 17, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Now, there's been a lot of ink spilled over this term, this phrase, God's righteousness. And we could have a semester class on it. I cannot get into all the details here, but I'll tell you what I think it means, and I'll also let you know that I take actually the broadest interpretation of it, so every other interpretation is kind of narrower, so that means that you're getting, basically, you're getting all of it. God's righteousness is God's rightness and his way of making the world right. That's what God's righteousness is. God's righteousness is God's way of making the world right. And the gospel reveals what God is doing to make things right, to transform things, to put the world to rights, every aspect of it, so that we can have a right relationship with him, so that we can have a right relationship with ourselves, so that we can have a right relationship with one another, and so that ultimately even the creation itself can be in right relationship. The gospel is God's power that transforms the world because it reveals something. That is, it unveils something. It doesn't just talk about it. It actually discloses something, something that was hidden all along but has now been unveiled. And what is it? How is God going to fix the world? This is how he's going to fix the world. This is where his righteousness is. It's on a hill outside of Jerusalem that the Jews call Golgotha, and the Romans call Calvary, and there, in the crucifixion and resurrection of his beloved son, God set the world to rights. And it's good news. And it's a revelation. It reveals how deep our need is. Because it took the death of the only beloved son of God to fix us. See, there was nothing in us that God could use. Humanity had to be brought to an end in the death of Jesus and made alive again. Christianity is not about reformation. It is about transformation. It is not about improvement. It is about death and resurrection. And the cross says, this is what has to occur. Humanity has to be put to an end and the cross of Jesus Christ, and raised anew. And it was. It reveals how deep our need is. It also reveals how great the provision is. Because God, God in the second person of the Trinity came, took on flesh, and suffered suffered under all the affliction with which we suffer. He took sin upon himself. He took the judgment upon himself. And he took it to the grave. And he rose again anew. So that there might be a new creation. The gospel reveals how deep our need is. The gospel reveals how great the provision is. And it transforms everything. It transforms our relationship with God. It gives us a new standing. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who have been justified by faith are at peace with God. We are God's beloved sons and daughters. And his banner over us is love. And his word to you is I accept you forgiven. No guilt in life. No fear in death. It transforms our relationship to sin because we have died in baptism, buried to the old world and powers of sin and death, and we have been risen anew, and now we have a new power, a power that comes not from inside but from outside, from the cross of Jesus Christ, and that power gives us new life so that sin can be dealt with and conquered and all the afflictions and all the proclivities which destroy us. It's a power. It reveals God's power to transform everything. This section in Romans goes right to talking about how the creation itself, creation itself is in bondage to sin. And then in Romans 8, it says creation itself will be set free. 
See, God has been looking for two things since the beginning of time, a holy people and a holy place. And you better believe the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ creates a holy people and a holy place. It transforms everything. In that great movie, The Princess Bride, the man in black is fighting Indigo Montoya. And as they're fighting, he's fighting Indigo Montoya. As they're fighting, Montoya is backed up against the cliff. And he says, I think you're better than me. And the man in black looks at him and he says, then why are you smiling? Because Montoya has a secret that he's about to reveal. And he flips his sword over to his right hand. He says, I'm not left-handed. And the battle turns. Guess what? We have a secret. God's secret. And when the gospel is proclaimed, that secret is unveiled. It is unleashed upon the world. And it's in the preaching of the gospel that people come to understand their need and God's provision. The gospel does not work on conditions that are pre-made for it. The gospel creates the conditions necessary for it to take effect. The gospel does not come to soils that are pre-made and ready. The gospel actually cultivates the soil. That's why our job is to preach good news and not bad news. Some preachers say, well, you have to hear the bad news first. What? No! The good news encompasses the bad news, and everybody knows that the world is bad. Even when they deny it, they're denying it because they don't believe actually what they're saying. That we're enslaved, and people know it. And our job is not to convince them of that. Our job is to preach the good news, to proclaim, I got good news for you. Christ died for sinners. And you better believe, when you proclaim that and the curtains open, they see their need. And they see the provision. I got a secret. That's why I'm smiling. That's why Paul is eager to go preach the gospel in Rome. And notice in verse 16, Paul doesn't say that the gospel recounts God's power. Paul doesn't say that the gospel gives you information about God's power. Paul doesn't say the gospel uh, tells you about how God has, has used his power. No, Paul says that the gospel, the preaching of the good news, is God's power. It's when we preach the gospel that God, by his Holy Spirit, makes those events that happened 2,000 years ago present in the life of a person. It brings the once-for-all death and resurrection of Jesus Christ into the present. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that we could fear today. My parents are afraid. What about my kids? I'm afraid. About, and there's a lot to fear. There's a lot to fear when we read the news. There's a lot to fear when we, when we look at, at the government. There's a lot to fear when we think about climate change. I mean, people are afraid. People are afraid inside the church. People are afraid outside the church. There's so much to fear. And listen, you should be afraid. You should be afraid unless unless there is a power greater than all those forces. And there is. It's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Martin Luther, I mentioned earlier, lived in a time of extreme economic upheaval. The feudal system was crumbling. He lived in a time of, uh, of extreme technological innovation with the making of the printing press. And it was like, people were freaking out. He also lived in a time where the church was bankrupt and weak. Sound familiar? But he didn't fear. He didn't fear because he found something in Romans 1, 17, 16 and 17 that was a power that was greater than all those forces. And he wrote about it, and we sing about it. 
And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word, the gospel word, shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, the body they may kill. Who cares? God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. The gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is unveiled. And by the way, it's for everybody. Which brings me to the last point. The last reason why I think Paul was so eager to preach the gospel in Rome is because of who the central message of Christianity is for. Verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone. Not some people, all people. And then he goes on to spell that out to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You see, in Paul's world, there were only two kinds of people. There were Jews and there were Greeks. The world was divided up between the circumcised and the uncircumcised. And the circumcised, you would have thought, these are the people who are prepared. They have the right soil to hear the gospel. They know the scriptures. They know the story. They know the covenant. Paul says, yes, the gospel is for them. But Paul actually is kind of like, I don't understand it, but it's not them who are actually responding the quickest. Who was responding the quickest to the gospel in Paul's ministry? The Greeks. The Greeks who had no understanding of a Christian worldview. No understanding that God created the world and there is one God who created the world and everything in it. No understanding of that the world is going to a place and has a purpose. No understanding that there is, that there is one God and not spiritual God, various gods everywhere. No understanding of any of that stuff. No understanding of sacrifice, no understanding uh, of the need for atonement, no understanding. And yet Paul says, the gospel's for them too. It's the power of God to transform everybody. And that means that it's the power of God to transform not just people who grew up in the church, not just people who, who have imbibed a kind of Christian, various Christian outlook on the world, who understand the biblical story and narrative, it's actually for people who have no familiarity with those things. Like people in Santa Barbara. Because Barna just came out with another study that said that we rank in the top 10 post-Christian cities in America. And we're only one of two on the West Coast. We're only one of two outside the Northeast. The other is Seattle. Uh, we're communicating to a people who, who are not ripe for the gospel. That's okay. The gospel doesn't wait till people are ripe for it. The gospel ripens them. And so we preach it. And it's not just for those unbelievers out there who are way off. It's not just for those people who have a semblance or understanding or kind of are haunted by the Christian message grow up in church, it's for everyone, including the person that stands before you now. It's for us too. It has to transform us as well and continue to. Because guess what? That righteous power, it's still from outside of us and it's something that we always have to ever be clinging to and receiving. So let me ask you, how long has it been since you were overcome by the power of the gospel, the good news? How long has it been since it revealed the depth of your need and the heights of God's provision? How long has it been since you have been transformed by it and seen someone transformed by it? We have to remember what power we have. Spurgeon was the probably greatest preacher, most popular preacher of the 19th century, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He was the great Baptist minister who ministered in London out of the Metropolitan Tabernacle. 
Spurgeon once drew an analogy to the gospel where he likened it to a caged lion. And he says, you know, lots of people say uh, uh, there's this caged lion there. And what if people said, like, I'm going to defend it. I'm going to defend it, and I'm going to to basically get an army and defend it. He said, I don't think an army is the best way to defend a caged lion. The best way to defend a caged lion, he says, is to let it out of the cage. Let the gospel out of the cage. We don't need to defend it. We don't need to hide from it. We need to proclaim it to one another and to our world. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.